Study Project, our podcast dedicated to helping you discover the scriptures in a fresh way, invest your mind and heart into your personal study, and connect to God in your everyday life. We are your hosts, Zach and Krista Horton. This week, we are here to study with you in Doctrine and Covenants 23 through 26. And, you know, one of the things that I say, which is not trite, I promise, is that we are excited to be here. But you know what? Tonight, I'm not really that excited to be recording a podcast (laughs) episode. Just keeping it real here that sometimes it's not that exciting to us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. And, you know, I do have to preface, or at least say, I don't know if this is a preface or not, but um, we've got some good chapters this week. It's just sometimes... It's not that fun to do things. It's 1040 at night and we're tired, but we're going to do it because we are excited about what we have studied and what we hope to help you study this week. So, And that prayer is a real thing because sometimes when we're stuck on our podcast episodes, we literally have to stop and say a prayer for help and almost always it works. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought it works when we say a prayer? Anyway, so here we are. We are ready. First, from last week, we have some great things that people have shared with us from our last week's question, which is, what would the Lord have me organize or establish in my life? Um, One says, moments of peace where I can feel the promptings of the Spirit and connect with Him. Isn't that true? We really do need to organize and create that space in our life to make that happen. I love that thought. Um, just a funny one. Someone says, besides everything. <laughs> I get. I feel that way sometimes too. I get that. Um, another one, I find that I need to organize my time. There are lots of good things out there, but I need to try to get the best things first. We all have so much to do in a day. What an important part of the organize, organizing and establishing and creation is that time to really take the time <laughs> to say what we need to do. Well, take the time to make sense. And that's what I resonates with me because that's what I've been doing this week is mm. thoughts and time. You and I were talking about, <laughs> you know, we mentioned Marie Kondo last week, but I thought you can probably do the same thing with your time or with your thoughts where you gather them all together. You know, all of the, for example, writing down everything that you have, that you do in a day and then going through one by one and asking, uh, is this something that that helps me, that brings me joy? Mm-hmm. Um, I loved, if I can, just briefly. Oh, Zach's going back to last week's episode again. Well, just because I found something that resonated with me as I kept studying. Um, in section 20, when the Lord uh, gives commandments, this is verse 7, he gives commandments to inspire Then in verse 8, he gives power and he gives means. And I thought that was a really healthy way, a helpful way for me to figure out what to keep in my life. Does it inspire me? Does it empower me? Or does it give me the means to do something that I need to do? And if it doesn't, do one of those three things. It's probably something I can get out of of there. So thoughts or uh, activities, things that take up my time. uh, That was one that was helpful for me this week. I love that. And that's actually kind of what this last one that I want to just read, because I think it answers that too, is she says, I need to create peace and be a peacemaker for myself, my family, and whoever I come in contact with. It's been really eye-opening pondering this and figuring out how I can create peace. If that's not one of those things that you think, okay, exactly that process is, this is going to bring me more joy if I take a little bit of time to create something that's going to be lasting and meaningful. So thank you again it's it's just so fun to hear um and great for us too i feel like it makes us it helps us as we prepare the next episode and stuff as we see what your studies are doing so again we're so grateful for um that and that again that's on instagram you can find us at scripture study project um and yeah we love to hear you participate okay um a brief asterisk next to this episode Um, because section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants is the only section addressed to a woman, and because it's well known for that, quite often our studies of this block, and specifically that section, section 25, section 25, focus on 
women. And we're not going to do that for a couple of reasons. Um, the main one is, I, I had the experience this week of asking some of my students for their questions about women and the church, and they came in all kind of varieties, and, and we spent some time studying them. But I noticed that there were some questions uh, about uh, a woman's worth in the church, place in the church. I had some incredibly insightful students that talked about the way that they feel uh, as women in the church, and it led to a great study. But one of the problems I noticed that came up as we talked about it is that when we talk about women in the church, we often do two things, I think, that are detrimental. Number one, uh, we kind of give women a blanket approval. And I, you've talked better about this, like how you felt on your mission when people would talk about... Like, oh, oh, I just, I couldn't stand is that maybe. <laughs> it really irked me <laughs> when it was... Oh, the sisters do everything perfect, mm-hmm. and the sisters do this, and I'm like, I live with the sisters, and we are not that perfect, or, you know, just that. Well, it's a little patronizing. Yeah, because of your gender, mm-hmm. we're going to give you blanket approval, and I think that's detrimental to our discussion, um, and our on our our understanding as a people, and it runs counter to the way that the Lord Himself treats Emma in section 25. If you read section 25, it reads very similar to all of the other sections of Revelation in that she is certainly given uh, an incredible calling and titles, and we'll talk more about that in this episode, but she's also given some commandments. She's given uh, some rebukes. Her promises are conditional upon her obedience. In other words, Emma is treated just like any other uh, saint and, and child of God. And so that's one detriment, and that's one reason why we're not going to focus this episode on quote-unquote how great women are, even though I know in a great number of incredible women, they're incredible because of who they are as individuals, not just because of their gender. And certainly not to shortchange the role that Emma played sure. in the sure. creation of the church. But the second thing I think is when we reach a place where we talk about women, we often focus that talk only on women. In other words, talking about women applies to women, which I I think if you're a woman in the church, you are very used to the experience of reading a scripture about a man or directed to a man and then applying that to yourself. However, uh, we don't have that many scriptures about women uh, comparatively or written to women. Uh, and when we when we have them, we often focus them only on women. What we want to do in this episode is not do that. We want to, instead of learning about women, we want to learn from a woman, this particular woman. And we want to learn from the others in sections 23, 24, 26 as well. Um, And we want to learn from them for us. And so if you're a man listening to this episode, we're going to study Emma Smith a little bit, but we're going to apply it to ourselves as men. Uh, her example is just as universally applicable as the prophet Joseph Smith's is. So with that small, maybe not so small caveat, here's what we do want to study. I'm sure I've mentioned this quote in some previous episode, but it is one of my all-time favorites. Um, And it's kind of an obscure reference. Uh, This is David O. McKay, and it's reported by, um, he gave it in a, a stake meeting and it's reported by someone else so it might not be completely accurately reported but it's I think I trust the reference and I I certainly trust the principle. Um, The story goes that President McKay, David O. McKay, was uh, walking out of his building one day, walking out of the church, I think church administration building, and he stopped to talk with some church employees. I think they were working on the grounds or something like that And, and the quote is this, Let me assure you, brethren, that someday you will have a personal priesthood interview with the Savior himself. If you are interested, I will tell you the order in which he will ask you to account for your earthly responsibilities. First, he will require an accountability report about your relationship with your wife. Have you actively been engaged in making her happy and ensuring that her needs have been met as an individual? Side note, this should go without saying, but this uh, I think these principles are universally applicable whether you're a man or a woman. Second, he will want an accountability report about each of your children individually. 
He will not attempt to have this for a simple family stewardship, but will require information about your relationship to each and every child. Third, he will want to know what you personally have done with the talents you were given in the pre-existence. Fourth, he will want a summary of your activity in your church assignments. He'll not be necessarily interested in what assignments you had, for in his eyes the home teacher and the mission president are probably equals, but he will request a summary of how you have been of service to your fellow man in your church assignments. Fifth, uh, he will have no interest in how you earned your living, but if you were honest in all your dealings. Sixth, he will ask for an accountability of what you have done to contribute in a positive manner to your community, state, country, and the world. I love that quote for the priorities that it sets. Obviously, family is first. What stands out to me, though, is this. We would often say, yes, family comes first, and then there uh, you know, church responsibilities, community responsibilities, work, some mix of those. I love the third one that he mentions, that he will want to know what you personally have done with the talents you were given in preexistence. I love that that is separate from church callings, from work assignments, from community involvement, and it it precedes and supersedes all of those. Uh, connected thought, a couple years ago, I read some research about job satisfaction, and this particular research says the thing that contributes most to people being happy in their job is when they feel they have, this was a non-religious source, when people feel they have been, quote, called, end quote, to something that uh, is in that field. Uh, they're, they're living a calling. Well, when it's a personal passion. Yeah, yeah. That's always what I think of. And so what we noticed, what I what we noticed as we studied this week was the number of times in these sections where the Lord talks about callings. Um, not church callings the way that we normally talk about them. Not a calling to, to Sunday school or to young women's or primary or any of those kind of callings. None of these are formal uh, handbook callings. These are much bigger callings. These uh, are callings that come from God himself to specific individuals to uh, put them to work in the world that they're living in and, and to serve the church and serve their community. And we've asked similar questions um, in previous episodes. What is my work? And all of those things that we discussed as we talked about Joseph Smith's calling greater calling in life to move the church of Jesus Christ forward. Um, but we felt like this one was maybe just a little more unique in some of these revelations, some of these answers that, that the Lord gives to these people. Because although they're asking for what their duty is in the church, in a lot of these examples, or they have questions about what their what part or role they're playing, um, a lot of them are more general. So hopefully that yeah, yeah. kind of clarifies it a little better. So the question we want to ask you, we want to invite you to ask yourself and ponder as you study this week is, what is my calling? That is not a question about your specific and current assignment within the church. It is a question about what talents God has given you and what does he expect you to do with them? And as you mentioned, we've been studying this topic and kind of around this topic the past couple of weeks and months. This week might be a great week to formalize some of that, to put it in writing, to, to signify it, give it a name, give it a title. Um, and then, as we'll mention at the end, to proclaim it to the world. So to help you, we've got a couple of questions about callings that we want to ask and answer. So the first one is... How do you figure out your calling? Now in church callings, this comes a little bit easier because we are literally given an assignment and a role and kind of know how that goes. But this is a little different. Um, how do we figure out that greater work and calling? So response number one to that question or help number one to that is that you ask the question. You ask yourself and you ask God. We can see and learn from these sections because that's how these all came was through questions. All of these revelations were always questions. Um, I, I loved the heading of section 23 that says, as the result of earnest desire on the part of the five persons named to know of their respective duties. And here they are, they get... Um, 
told what they are supposed to do at this time. And now this could be a little confusing because we're talking generally about callings and maybe we could say, well, these are actually kind of callings in the church. But at this point in time, they didn't they didn't have actual callings within the church. There were maybe two or three that the Lord had specified. So these are people really trying to fit into what God wanted them to do to move the work forward, which is the next answer to that question of how do I figure out my calling is found a few times throughout these sections. And I'll just read the one in section 23, verse 4, where it says that his calling is to strengthen the church. And I would maybe even use that a little broader is what's going to strengthen the world, my community? How can I help move God's work of goodness and love forward? Now, sometimes that's going to apply to the church or to the work of proclaiming the gospel specifically, but I think it can even be shown in a greater sense too. Well, if I can insert just another example too, uh, in section 25, Emma is called verse five to be a comfort unto her husband and the prophet Joseph Smith. And then in verse 8, he is called to be a support to her. Both of their callings are to support and sustain each other. And I think of how often, as I've wrestled with this question of what my calling is, what God wants me to do, how often it's focused, maybe always focused on somebody else, on service to somebody else. So not only looking to lift the world necessarily or the church, but individual people. Um, I know that was something that I really loved when we got feedback from, from you as listeners on those questions that we posed each week of what is my work. A lot of them, well, probably almost all of them actually were really surrounding particular people in your life or community or, um, that you were doing. And I think that's a great example of that. Um, And then the last one, which ties these all together, is realize your strengths. God is wanting you to find joy and growth in the things that you love, that he, he uses our strengths. I guess that's the better way to put it. And I love the example thinking of Emma. We know that Emma was known for her beautiful soprano voice. And so thinking that realization that I have as I was reading a little more about Emma and then thinking that one of her assignments was to bring um, the hymns and creating a hymnal for the church, which I just think is kind of fun to think about that he knew that that was something that she would enjoy. And maybe I'm assuming a little bit, but the, the art that they portray, she was having a good time while she was collecting that hymnal. <laughs> And I think that's the same case for us is that we can find joy as we figure out what our greater calling or commission is from the Lord. I like that a lot. The question that I focused on was how long do callings last? Uh, We know that in the church, callings, almost all callings are temporary unless it's general authority calling or patriarch calling. Um, But... Uh, I think there is also a timeline sometimes to the callings that God gives us. And as evidence of that, notice in section 23, Hiram is uh, given the calling, as are others, to exhort and to strengthen the church continually. But right before that, the Lord says to him, thy tongue is loosed. And we know that right after this, Hiram becomes one of the first missionaries to start teaching and spreading uh, the message of the church and and the message of the prophet around. If you'll remember back in section 11, Hiram is commanded not to declare the word, but to obtain the word. In other words, in section 11, his calling is not to teach other people yet, but to study it for himself. Here we are in section 23, and now he is called to teach it. But if you noticed his brother Samuel in verse 4, thou art not as yet called to preach before the world. But we also know that Samuel Smith became one of the greatest missionaries the church has ever known. Later, he would be called. In other words, uh, God calls us to do different things at different times. Just because your calling right now might be something doesn't mean that it will always be that. 
and also just because you may want to do something and don't feel called to it or ready for it now doesn't mean that it can't be a calling that you can have later on. I fully believe that in these types of callings, uh, aspirations are wonderful. We should aspire to be called to strengthen and exhort the church. We should aspire to be a strength to the people around us. I always like an answer to this question is thinking of seasons of life. Um, there's a lot of things that I've wanted to do over the past few years that I just knew realistically wasn't my time to do it. As I was growing a family and doing a lot of things that made it really not possible for me to do certain things that I maybe long to do or feel called to do. So I think that it's important to remember that as we're seeking to figure out our calling from God or the things that bring us satisfaction that will strengthen and build is that we don't have to do it all at once and we can do it at different times and seasons and chapters of our lives. Well, and that can be difficult when you are seeing someone else in a different season than you are doing something that you want to do. Uh, in section 24, uh, God gives different callings to different people at different times. Uh, verse 9, Joseph is told, In temporal labors, labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. Attend to thy calling, which listed earlier on, verse 6, uh, to or verse 7, to devote all thy service to Zion. Joseph is given a spiritual calling to be a prophet, but not a temporal calling. It's interesting that in section 25, um, Emma is given some temporal callings to create a physical hymn book. And of course, later on when the Relief Society will be formed, they are given the temporal service of caring for the poor needy, which of course is a spiritual work as well. But it's interesting to note that different people are given different assignments at different times. And so to the answer of how long do callings last, of course, that's up to the Lord. But I think it's helpful for us to be sensitive to his timing uh, and that that might help us realize what callings are coming to us in our current season. Okay, then our last question, what should I do once I have my calling? And we're going to first answer that with give it a name because we love in section 25 and everyone does. This is the, the thing that we all know about section 25 is that Emma is given the title of elect lady. And I love what that we learned that Emma was later when she was called as the first Relief Society president. This revelation was referenced and read by Joseph as he called her as the elect lady that would be in charge of the Relief Society. And in the years following, often the Relief Society general president or the main Relief Society president was often called elect lady. And so they used that term and gave it a title for what her role was or what her greater calling was. And though that was used in a specific calling sense, we learn here that Emma was an elect lady for her goodness. There was, that became a title, but this was used as something that was general. So that aside, give it a name. I think there's power behind a title. The title makes it real. And maybe even one step deeper in that, as you discover what your calling might be, I think giving it a title or giving it a place on a sheet of paper that maybe you write out, I think this is the calling that God wants me to be doing. I think there's power in putting words to paper and there's power in that title. Well, you think of the way that we, uh, in our church callings, they're given names, there's titles, they're very recognizable titles, there's handbook sections written about those callings, and so they're very concrete and tangible things. I know what I'm supposed to do if I am an advisor in the deacon's quorum. But in these kinds of callings that come more directly, uh, or more broadly, I guess, uh, giving them a title and giving them some similar specificity I think can help us not only realize what it is, but how it is that we should uh, enact or act on that calling. So answer number two to that one, what should I do once I have a calling, comes from section 23, verse 2, where Oliver is told to make thy calling known unto thy church. Um, another thing that gives a calling power is when you 
commit to it out loud to someone else. And now there might be times where the calling that we feel like we need to do isn't something that we necessarily share with others. But often if we're wanting to commit to something that feels hard or feels big, then sharing it with your desire with someone else can make it really solidified and give yourself a little more power and also accountability. Well, there's also a benefit for others when we make our calling known. Um, on our last ward when I was serving in the bishopric, one of the things that made uh, that, that we loved as a bishopric is when someone would express to us their passions. In other words, their callings. If someone came in and said, I love working with the youth. It's something I'm really passionate about. That person almost always got a calling to uh, a church calling or church assignment to work with the youth. Now we're hesitant, I think, to do that because we feel that church callings have to always be a surprise. And if I tell someone, if I tell the bishopric what my desires and passions are, then I'm ruining the surprise. And somehow if it's not surprising, then it's not revelatory. But President Nelson has said, good revelation requires good, uh, a good inspiration requires good information. And the best information that uh, church leaders can have in giving us our callings or extending callings to us is to know what our callings are from God. So if you were to go to your bishopric and say, boy, I sure love teaching the gospel, or I sure love serving and ministering to other people, or I have these neighbors next to me and I would love to take care of them, making your calling known to the church, I think can be a really powerful way to link together this type of calling that we're studying with your uh, official or or formal callings within the church. So take some time this week and ask yourself, and maybe, uh, Chris, as you said, write down uh, your calling or callings that you have. Maybe you're writing down ones that you want to have. Oh, that's another one we should have said, is that there can be a More couple. than one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we learn that from all of these revelations. Yep. A lot of people are called to do many things. Yeah. Uh, remember how you figure out your calling through questions, through looking to other people around you and realizing your strengths. Remember that callings can come at different times to different people and in different ways. And remember that once you have that calling, giving it a name and then making it known can be a really healthy way and helpful way uh, of uh, enacting that calling. In section 26, it's a brief section, uh, but it gives the law of common consent, which is that all things in the church are done through common consent. We agree and agree to sustain those around us. And I love the phrase that verse 2, all things are done by common consent in the church by much prayer and faith. Uh, I think callings, whether they're church callings or these more general broad ones, uh, I think are always done best when they come with much prayer and faith. So enjoy your much prayer and faith this week as you study uh, your calling, and we will see you next episode.